For a change of pace in the levity zone, let's teleport back in time to the first of several Dr. Bruce's Deep 90s episodes. Back in the mid-90s, I had relocated from Prague, deep in Eastern Europe, to a tiny cabin in the Redwoods, where I was deeply concentrating on helping to birth a new medium, Avatar Cyberspace. To supplement this purely speculative venture, I was working on tech projects for the electronic document industry with my friend, journalist Derek Malevsky. Derek was also chronicling the new phenomena of cyberspace for his show on UC Berkeley's radio station KLAX. One day in March of 1996, Derek called me to meet him in Concord, California, at Bank of America's main IT facility. There we would sit down in the cafeteria with another friend of his, a nerdy software consultant named Craig Newmark. For those of you who don't know that name, you surely know about Craigslist, the world's largest online classified ad system, which at the time we met, Craig was changing from a mailing list to a website. Dark's question to both of us that day was, what is the future of publishing, and will the book still exist in a few years? Although Craig does not mention Craigslist, his answers to Darek's questions show his acute sense of technology and trends. I enjoyed this brief encounter with one of today's household names of the Internet, and I hope you will enjoy this listen, too, back at the dreamy days of the mid-90s, when all seemed possible. superhighway, these are only a few of the buzzwords that our media, mainstream and alternative, are serving us every day. In many cases we simply ignore it. But sometimes we feel threatened by a new medium that we don't yet fully understand. Today there are more magazines about internet than about swimsuits and literature combined. We can now access our checking account over the net. We can trade our stock online. Two, there is room for digital romance and cyber sex. Doomsday is slowly approaching for one of the our oldest media, the printed page. Ah, yes, we all heard about the paperless office. That never worked out. How successful will the paperless book and the cyber newspaper be? What's the digital future of these media? Will they survive? Will we have something to read in bed? Will we be balancing our laptop PC on the pillow? With the recent price hikes in paper costs, book publishers are really worried about their disappearing margin. Some local newspaper publishers are already on the edge of extinction. Will Internet help them survive? We directed these and other questions to our two guests, Craig Newmark, an independent multimedia consultant, and Bruce Daimer of Digital Space Corporation. What does the future of the book look like? Oh, there's a whole lot of issues involved in you know, replacing traditional publications with electronic ones. Um, of course, there's the obvious issue of copyright and who pays for this. Those problems are being solved. A uh, bigger issue is simply that people like dealing with paper. It's more portable. That will be addressed someday. We only see the first glimmers of that now. There's also a certain uh, sensual and aesthetic appeal to paper, books, and all that. And for that reason, maybe we'll see books and uh, paper in some form uh, forever. We don't know that one. Some publishers, what they've started doing is putting selected chapters online, and that seems to be working for them. Uh, some publishers 
magazine publishers, for example, after the month has passed or so, then they'll put the entire magazine online. And all these are perceived as not hurting the paper publications, but perhaps enhancing them. What about magazine like Omni Magazine, that is uh, just about to stop uh, being published uh, traditionally and um, will be delivered only electronically? How does this affect, in, in, in broader perspective, uh, the, the magazine publishing industry? Um, not being a publishing guy, but having paid some attention, I guess it's a matter of two things, uh, who your target market is. Are they web-enabled, web-savvy? Uh, my guess is the Omni market is probably full of early adopters. And then it has to do with what model of magazine uh, revenue you're into. Uh, if you're into the advertising model and you can find the advertisers, then this is going to work. An interesting point. Um, I talked with Keith Farrell, who's the the director of general media that publishes Omni, and uh, one of the problems that Omni has is the readership picks up a, an Omni and they spend a couple of hours with the issue. And for an advertiser, they don't like this. They want people to skim the magazine and go th to the next magazine and get through as much advertising as possible. So Omni's been having a real problem with its advertising, uh, the commitment of its advertisers, because it's too dense, uh, full of information for people. So they're kind of being squeezed from, from that perspective out of traditional publishing. But how can I uh, apply the same to uh, magazines like The, the Economist or, or Newsweek? Well, will the advertisers really want me to just skip the content? So why would I want to buy such magazine to, to look at the ads? Well, the other model for supporting, say, a webzine of some sort is the subscription model. Um, there are magazines whose content is so valuable that people will pay for them. What kind of magazines? Uh, you were talking about The Economist. There, that has a specialized readership, which I believe, I'm guessing, tends to be affluent, and they're willing to pay for content. And since the cost of publishing an electronic magazine is typically far less and publishing paper, uh, they might wind up paying for subscriptions which are much cheaper than, uh, than paper. We're going to see other things evolve in ways that no one knows right now, because at this point, the, in the terms of the future of publishing, as this converges with what we think of as TV, we're going to have uh, far more information than we can ever hope to deal with. And at that point, when we have intelligent agents, uh, human or otherwise, scouring the net for what we want to read, it could be that we're not going to see magazines anymore because we're going to have these agents going out looking for us for what we want to read, and the whole concept of a magazine may just disappear. That's just a guess. Uh, <laughs> this kind of speculation uh, will probably get me in trouble, but it's fun to think about. I guess I've, um, I haven't been around on the planet very long, but when new media come around, it seems like people always say that they're going to be, re you know, t television would destroy all the theaters. Well, the theaters offered a slightly different approach to the same thing, uh, and the theaters evolved and survived quite well, and, and yet another layer was added, television was added, and I think this is just another, another layer on, on top. One of the things that uh, the World Wide Web does bring, which is pulled out in the little community that I live in, Boulder Creek, in the middle of the Redwood Forest. We've had a poets group for several years, and we have readings every month, and we put our poetry online every month. It's updated. And that site has been getting several thousand hits or accesses per week, uh, up to about 5,000 per week. We, we, we spice it up with a lot of nice graphics, but none of those poets had the chance of a flame in an Antarctic blizzard of ever getting published and certainly never getting published in volume and, and they have readership uh, without remuneration. I agree. I uh, don't want to imply that magazines and so on will go away. What I mean to imply is that we're evolving new forms of publishing. On the web, everyone is their own publisher. The cost is almost zero. And things at this point... Uh, are really unpredictable.
we're going to see everything with a lot of social implications. Yes, let's talk about the social implications. Uh, you said that costs are uh, nearly zero to publish anything on the Internet, but in order to publish anything, you have to have access. And uh, with the very, even very optimistic statistics, a majority of people in this country, at least, uh, have no access to the Internet, cannot afford the access to the Internet. How will you address that, this? Uh, you're referring to the problem of simply the fact that some people, early adopters, and people who are affluent, do have Internet access to one extent or another. A lot of people have never touched or come near a PC or Mac. And I don't have any answers for that one. There is a have, have not problem. And that problem is probably getting worse. But a lot of people involved with the net are thinking about it and taking in small steps actions regarding that. There's a CPSR. I think that's Computer Professionals for Social Responsibility. They're addressing it. There's the Electronic Frontier Foundation, recently relocated to the Bay Area. They're thinking about it. And on an individual level, I figure the best thing I can do is friends who need to get net access. I find uh, a provider suitable for them. I uh, hook them up. And it's a small step, but it's what an individual can do. Right now, even if you have a nice little uh, laptop, um, I'm sure there are people who will bring them to bed with, with themselves, but that's even a very small part of the uh, early adopter public. We're not going to see that happening until we get, let's say, bendable and portable uh, readable devices, which are purely these days, as far as I know, the matter of science fiction. Neil Stevenson's Diamond Age describes such a device based on nanotechnology, but uh, <laughs> while it's fun to read about, I am not going to wait for it. Uh, nanotechnology, of course, is all around us in every living thing, you know, every leaf and every, you know, every finger that is running a keyboard is run by biological nanotechnology, but I think nature had three and a half billion year development cycle on, on this. And uh, I think the human beings, perhaps one of the things that's accelerated by the net is this kind of feeling of arrogance that everything is possible. Now we've, we've, we've spanned the globe and uh, perhaps we're getting even worse in our arrogance and believing that we can manipulate uh, everything with ease. And when you look at uh, manipulating atoms uh, to build things like this flexible device or uh, how nature does it, um, I think it's, an, it's several orders of magnitude more difficult than our arrogant engineering sense will, will let, us, let us believe. It occurs to me that there are now goggles which are computer display screens and maybe, remember how unpredictable things are, maybe these will catch on, and you might read a book through these goggles, which will be IR connected to your PC, and maybe that is a way that we'll read newspapers or TVs or whatever while we're on the train, uh, when we're in bed or whatever. Who knows? Um, technology has been surprising us more now than ever in history. Plus, everyone <laughs> it seems to have a bad track record in predicting all this. No one uh, foresee, foresaw the web and its explosion. I'm looking forward to being surprised. I run into Craig Newmark now and then at parties here in the Bay Area, but had long forgotten about our first meeting until Darek digitized it from cassette tape and sent it to me a few years ago. I will surely send Craig a link to this podcast so that he, too, can teleport back to the deep 90s. Derek also digitized two more tapes, these containing some pretty fascinating conversations between us in 1995 and 1996 that presage the rise of multi-user avatar virtual worlds, which led to today's multiplayer social spaces and game platforms. Those dreams and first experiments from 20 years ago will soon be coming to you in the Levity Zone. Find us on the web at www.levityzone.org, on iTunes, SoundCloud, under Levity Zone, and now on YouTube under my personal channel at Bruce 
Damer.